Bakersfield Police Chief Greg Terry joins me now for a newsmaker. Chief Terry, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. I want to first talk about um, an officer involved shooting that happened nearly two months ago on Chester Avenue, and it received a lot of attention. And it happened on Chester Avenue back in January. And your department said at the time that a man was sitting in his car for several hours um, and was parked on the side of the road, had been sitting in that car for several hours, and he eventually fired a shot at officers, and officers returned fire. There's been so many questions, though, that have come from this investigation on just some basic questions. We know that just on, on scene, there were a lot of uh, shell casings that were around, and some questions of how many officers fired their weapon, how many officer, how, how many shots were fired, mm -hmm. some of those basic questions that seems like haven't been answered. I have to just first ask you, why, has it, why does it sometimes take a long time to get some of those basic questions answered following something like this? Those are all good questions and, and we want the public to know. These are very uh, complex and difficult uh, investigations for many different reasons, certainly for the, the families and the individuals involved. But broader than that, we don't, I don't want the community to wonder about these things. And so we work very hard to get information out uh, as quickly as we can. We have the detectives that are investigating it that really are the link between um, the incident, the investigation, and the family or the family members that are impacted by that. So we certainly encourage them to be reaching out if they don't have contact or don't feel like they're getting in the information, they should be contacting us uh, and we'll provide whatever information we can. Broader than that, as we move through, this was a very large scene, involved a, number, uh, a large number of people. Uh, we are getting to the point now where our community debriefing that we normally release with this is going to come out very soon. And so the, the public will have much more detailed information. But again, uh, they are complex when we're dealing with large numbers of people or trying to find down witnesses or trying to uh, determine what evidence is from where and from whom. Um, a lot of those kinds of things are ongoing now. But again, we don't want this to be a mystery for, uh, in, for our community in, in particular. And so uh, there'll be some more information coming out here pretty quickly. Can you just talk about the complexities of these types of investigations? Because, yeah. you know, there's a lot, again, you talk about a lot of confusion that can come up. Mm -hmm. When the community is wondering, why, why can't you give information on some basic questions? And there's officer, officers are wearing body cameras and so mm -hmm. forth. And why can't this stuff just be put out there yeah. almost immediately? Can you just talk about why? Why, why does it take so long sometimes to release some of these some of these uh, parts of the investigation? So the there's a couple different components to that. Yes, there is body cams, and we're thankful for that. Um, but as the as when these incidents occur, there's an investigation that has to take place. There's interviews that have to be done, and so we immediately begin watching the body cameras. Our public information staff begin trying to acquire the body cams trying to begin putting out together a, a public release for this. But we've got to make sure that we've interviewed people before videos are released so that we make sure that we're getting the best information that we can. A lot of times we have to interview witnesses that may have seen it and we don't want to put a, a video of it because that, that might taint uh, their recollection of the event or whatever that they share. So there's some dynamics there. Internally, the, the police department more recently has had some staff turnovers in our public information office. So that extends some of the timeline of being able to sit down and do the technical work of putting a video together. But again, we do not want our community to wonder about these things. Uh, very basic information such as the number of officers involved, we normally release that pretty quickly. And so uh, if there are those kinds of questions that haven't been asked, uh, I want to know about it because we'll release that information. But again, in this particular incident, our community debriefing video will be coming out very soon. I want to talk about something that we have discussed many, many times, and mm -hmm. I know it impacts almost every single uh, family in Kern County, and that is just uh, what is happening when it comes to uh, students, young kids, um, accessing uh, the internet on school-issued laptops, on other devices. That might not necessarily be uh, school-issued, but we're seeing more and more online predators start to contact our kids here in Kern County. And I feel like every couple of months we have another big case that we're, that we're, we're yeah. discussing. Yeah. There's a lot of fear, of course, that, mm -hmm. that comes from every time we report on something like this. Last month we did a whole report on um, a, a student being able to, who contact or who was in contact with someone, a person from out of state. There was explicit messages being exchanged on a school issued laptop. What is your advice to parents? What do parents need to do right now even if they have a school-issued device in their home? I think it's kind of a, 
again, to bring a little bit of perspective to it, we, we think of ourselves, um, we, we routinely think of ourselves into our homes, we lock the doors and windows, we're safe for the night, uh, we're not worried about people coming in or points of vulnerability, we have lighting, we have alarms, a lot of those things. We need those same kinds of proactivity in the digital world because you can't lock the doors and all mm -hmm. the windows because there's people looking and trying to probe and finding ways to get in. And so, but that really is the approach that I think common sense have relationships with your children, talk to them about the vulnerabilities, talk to them about the fact that there are people out there. We talk about stranger danger, buddy systems out in the feet when you're walking to school or going to a store or playing in the neighborhood. You need those kinds of conversations with them. Talk, this is a real danger and a real threat. You can certainly employ a lot of technology solutions right. to lock the computers down, to lock the d digital devices down. Uh, don't let them have them alone in their bedrooms. Very practical things that we need to be thinking about, but really is about relationships and education uh, is the most proactive thing that we can do. Really quick before we go, we've got a motor competition to talk about that's happening on yeah. the Parker River Walk. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is the first time that we've uh, hosted it. Um, we've been bringing back over the last several years our, our police motorcycles. Uh, enforcement is a very important part of our traffic safety program. But this year we'll be inviting uh, departments from uh, particularly in Northern California that will be here competing uh, with our motors the, this Saturday out of Riverwalk. So, yeah, it's a very unique thing and we certainly uh, would ask the public to come out and watch. How do you think... Uh your officers are going to do. I think we'll do very well. <laughs> All right, Chief Terry, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And the news and uh, look at your forecast coming up next.